lonely again. I know every thought before you think it, every word before you speak it. My presence impedes on your innermost being. Can you see how silly it is to try to hide something from me? You can easily deceive other people and even yourself. But I read you like an open, large print book. Deep within themselves, most people have some awareness of my intimate presence. Many people run from me and deny my existence because my closeness terrifies them. But my own children have nothing to fear, for I have cleansed them by my blood and clothed them in my righteousness. Be blessed by my intimate nearness. Since I live in you, let me also live through you, shining my light into the darkness. The scripture comes from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out in my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. That comes from Psalms 139, verses 1 through 4. I feel Jesus in this place. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus in this place. Yes, my soul does burn within me. I feel Jesus in this place. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus in this place. Yes, my soul does burn within me. I feel Jesus in this place. heavens in the name of Jesus Christ we come. God, we thank you for another privilege. We thank you, God, for allowing us to come before you. We ask you to bless us, Father God, as we move to honor you on tonight. We thank you, Father God, and we say hallowed to your name, for you are the great God. You are the great King. You are the one who blesses us and keeps us. And for that, Lord, we are thankful and we are grateful. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will hear from you on tonight. Bless us, Father God, that we will be about your business to do your will. We pray, Father God, that your word speak to us. We pray that the transmission goes well. We pray, Father God, that men, women, boys, and girls will be touched by your word, that your word will reside in their heart, and they will be made the better. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And thank God.
bless the name of Jesus. We have come again to honor him and to give him glory, to study the word of God, that the word of God will be clearly delivered unto us on tonight. We are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. On last week, we were dealing with verses 6 through 9. On this week, we'll deal with verses 10 through 13. I feel real obligated to go back and review as our transmission was not that great on last week. So let's go back and look at verse number 1 <clears throat> up to verse number 13 on tonight. So we'll be looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Our focus tonight is verse 10, or is verse 10 through, through 13. So when we look at uh, 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul begins, and in verse number 1, he talks about closing out. How do I know he's closing out? Because the New King James Version says, finally. He's closing out the book of 2 Thessalonians. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. The apostle Paul says that we ought to be praying for leaders. We ought to be praying for spiritual leaders. We ought to be praying for our pastors. You ought to be praying for your pastor that the word of God will run swiftly, that the word of God will have God's speed, that the word of God will spread, that the word of God will have its course. God's word never goes out and returns void. So we ought to be praying that the word of God is spread rapidly. Apostle Paul talks about the fact that these uh, people at Thessalonica, these newborn Christians at Thessalonica, they are up against some unreasonable and wicked men. Just like we are in this day, there are men who don't believe the gospel and they are on a mission to make sure they stamp out the gospel. They're on a mission to make sure that men who believe in the gospel become confused. They want to make sure that men, women, boys, and girls who trust the story of this death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they want to confuse it. They want to throw in a little heresy here and a little heresy there. They really, really want to confuse things. So the Apostle Paul, as he closes out, chapter 3, closes out 2 Thessalonians completely, he says, whatever you do, pray for us. We ought to pray for the preacher. We ought to pray for the evangelist. We ought to pray for the pastor, pray for the teacher. We ought to pray that the word of God goes with swift feet. The word of God speed on, that the word of God will spread rapidly, that the word of God will run its course. Because the word of God can make men better. Not only should we be praying that, 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 that it will run with swiftness and that the word of God be exalted or glorified and triumph. We ought to make sure that we spend our quality time in prayer for the word of God to be spread. And we ought to pray that the preachers, the teachers, the ministers of Jesus Christ will be able to present with ease, be able to present without hindrance, be able to present uh, comfortably. So we ought to make the word of God spread and run based on us becoming the catalyst to make sure it happens. So we ought to make sure that the word of God is spread with enthusiasm and excitement. We want to make sure the word of God is spread. It, it runs swiftly. That that we will be that the word will be exalted to be glorified, even as it has been with you. Even as it has done with you. So the apostle Paul says that we want to make sure the word of God runs. 
Then verse 2, he says, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for some do not have the faith. This word wicked is perverse men. This word wicked is uh, improper and unrighteous men. Unrighteous men will always look to destroy the kingdom of God. And don't take it personally because they are really not after you. They are after God and his word. Because your testimony is good, but it's his story that makes the difference. Your testimony uh, calls people to shout, calls people to rejoice, and we ought to rejoice. But at the end of the day, it is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is the story of Jesus Christ that makes one whole. So we ought to make sure that we pray for leaders, pray for pastors, pray for preachers. And, and when you pray that the word of God be, be, be exercised speedily, will take on speed, spread rapidly. And then he says that we will be delivered from ungodly, wicked. This word wicked is malicious men. This word wicked is evil and harmful men. Some translation put it this way, that we will be delivered from the evil one, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, the accuser of the brethren. We ought to pray that the, the word of God runs with swiftness. We ought to pray that we be delivered, that, that the kingdom be delivered from the wicked one, the evil one. Verse number three, he says, but the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. The Lord is faithful. He is faithful, meaning that God is trustworthy. If you cannot trust your friends, you can't trust your neighbors, you can't trust your family members, you can't trust your associates, you can trust God. He says, keep praying that the word was spread. Keep praying that we will be delivered from wicked men and the evil one and the devil. And just remember, verse number three, he says, remember, regardless of what they do, but the Lord is faithful. The Lord is trustworthy. The Lord, the Lord, the, the supreme God, the one in authority, he is, he is faithful. He says he's so faithful until he will establish you. The word establish means he will strengthen you and he will confirm you. The word of God helps us to be stabilized. God himself establishes us. He strengthens us. He confirms us. He confirms us in the middle of our enemies. That's why the psalmist said he prepared the table before you in the presence of your enemies. So keep going, keep moving, keep striving, keep praying, keep supporting and exalting each other because God is faithful. The Lord is faithful. He's trustworthy to deliver you from the evil one. Verse number four, he says, says to us, and we have confidence and we, us, those of us who are believers, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. Paul says, we as ministers, we as preachers, we have confidence. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you. Both that you do and will do the things we commanded you. In other words, we've already given you the, the ingredients. We've already given you the stuff to put into it to make it right. And he's saying, we got confidence. We got confidence in the Lord. That's why you hear people say, don't trust me, but trust the Lord in me. Because if the Lord is in you and the Lord is at the helm, the Lord is taking full control, then you can trust the Lord. And we got confidence in the Lord that you will continue to do what you've been doing <laughs> and that you are doing it right now. Uh, he says that we have confidence in you concerning the Lord that you are doing and you will continue to do the things which are, which we have commanded you. 
in which we have charged you. So you got to continue to do this thing. Every day of our lives as Christians, we must wake up every day with our mind stayed on Jesus and our attitude turned toward Jesus, that we will make sure that the word of God runs swiftly. And, and God has placed his confidence in us that we will maintain our eyes on him. And because God has placed confidence in us, the preachers and the teachers and the leaders have placed confidence in us, we ought to keep doing the great things that the word of God has asked us and continue to require of us to do. He says, now, verse five, now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse number five, he says, may the Lord direct your hearts into, in other words, the Lord reveals to you. The Lord helps you to realize that, and the Lord shows you things that you normally wouldn't see. This word direct means to guide. May the Lord guide you. Guide you. May the Lord guide your hearts. Your hearts here means your spirit, your, your mind. May the Lord guide you. May the Lord show you. May the Lord reveal unto you the love of God. That's why not one single person should be thinking about suicide. Because the love of God is in you. The love of God is present for you. You should not ever think about your life not being worthy of living because God loves you. He loves you with a special type of love. And if there had not been anyone on planet earth but you, God would love you. And regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you've said, regardless of how you have lived, God loves you. Not only does God love you, he offers a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you. So may God show you and reveal unto you, you so you can realize the love of God. He says, he says in verse, verse number five, he says, and into the patience of Christ. Into the patience of Christ. This word patience means you got to be waiting on it. A lot of people say they are waiting on God. They, they say they're waiting on him. But many times we get ahead of God. Sometimes we pray about it and we have our minds made up before we begin to pray. Sometimes people say they pray about it and they honestly do pray about it. But when they pray about it, they don't wait to hear what God has to say. I'm saying to you today, my dears, whatever you do, spend quality time with God. So he can reveal unto you by way of his Holy Spirit. He can reveal unto you by way of his word. That's why it's so important for us to stay in his word. Mm -hmm. His word reveals things unto us that we will never see with the natural mind. He says that, that the God in his patience, into, he, will, he will take you into the patience of Jesus Christ. Be steadfast. Steadfastness and the patience of Christ Jesus. This word Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah himself. God wants to bless us by way of the Messiah, mm -hmm. meaning that he is the deliverer. He's the one that has come to rescue us, not just the Jews. He has come to rescue us. Verse number six, Paul began verse number six in this pericope from verses six to nine warning them against idleness. He's building up a swell. He's building up a wall. He's building up a peak to talk about what he really want men to do with their lives. First thing he says, don't be idle. <laughs> Look at what he says, verse number six. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says it's a command. It's not... It's not a suggestion. It's not a question. 
It is a command. It's a direct charge. He says, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he says our Lord Jesus Christ, it means the Messiah, the one who's in authority. And when he speaks of Jesus Christ, what he's saying is he's our Lord, meaning that, that he controls us. He, he's our master. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the anointed one. He's the Messiah. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, what he's saying is that he is the key authority. He is the ultimate authority. He's saying to us, we command you in the name of the ultimate authority, Jesus Christ. He says, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which he received from us. Verse number six says, you ought to withdraw from them. Verse number six declares that we ought to, we ought to separate ourselves from, from them. In other words, if a brother is a believer, if a brother is a follower of Christ, you ought to uh, withdraw from him, meaning if he's slack, if he is one who's living a lazy life, if he is one who is idle, it says withdraw from him. <clears throat> In other words, the one who's not doing or not performing his, his or her duties. Now, in the 21st century church, we don't do that. If a person is not performing his or her duty, we just let them stay there. The Apostle Paul says this is church discipline, and in church discipline, withdraw yourself from them. If they're not in the performing, the performing of their duties, withdraw from them. If they are disorderly, meaning if they are not following the tradition by which we've given you, and this word tradition here is not tradition as we see it today. This word tradition is the ordinances, the laws, the, the instructions that we have given you. If they don't follow those instructions, withdraw yourself from them. Boy, there will be a lot of empty churches if we live like this. There will be a lot of churches that don't have bodies in places. But we, we don't do it that way. We don't do it. Uh, they live in, these people who are living, and they're not living according to what we have told you, the instructions we've given you, don't even receive them. Don't participate with them. These are believers, believers who know what is right, and they keep doing what is wrong. I mean, you can apologize only so many times, right? I mean, but if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, the Bible says withdraw from them. The Bible says that they, they, they are not carrying the same doctrine. If they are, are disorderly, if they are not living according to the, the instructions that we've given you, withdraw from them. I think the songwriter was right when he said, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Yeah, <laughs> one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. In other words, we have to get to a point in our lives where we realize that God's instruction is more important than our friendship. See, in church, we are concerned about friendship. We are concerned about what our friends think and what our associates think. We are concerned about what our neighbors think. We need to be more concerned about the instructions, the traditions that God delivers unto us. Verse number seven, for you yourself know how you ought to follow us. Now, these are men talking to other men. And these men, Paul, Silas, they are talking, and Timothy, they are talking to other men. And they are telling other men that you already know how you ought to follow us. Look at what he says. He says, you ought to follow us. These are normal, everyday men, but they've been anointed by God. And they are saying, you all ought to follow us. 
God deliver me from so many people these days that always talk about, I don't have to follow him. He's a man just like I am. He put on his britches the same way I do, one leg at a time. That's ignorance. That's ungodliness. Paul says, follow us. You already know. You already know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly. So Paul says, not only should you follow us because we are men of God, you follow us because we are following the doctrine of Jesus Christ. This word disorderly comes up again. He says, we were not disorderly among you. Verse 8, nor did we eat anyone else's bread free of charge, but worked with, with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we did not have authority, but to, do, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, you already know how you should follow us. Yes, you should follow us according to the, the instructions we've given you. And yes, we are normal men. We are men just like you are, but we have given you instructions. I command you, I charge you to follow these instructions by which we've given you because number one, we were not disorderly men among you. In other words, we practice what we preached. God, God is watching and God wants us to practice what we preach. The apostle Paul says, we practice what we preached in your presence. Whatever we told you to do, we were willing to do it. Then he goes on to say, nor did we eat anyone else's bread free of charge. In other words, we paid for what we got. We all know that it is the church responsibility. If you don't know, let me tell you, it is the church responsibility to take care of the man of God and his family. It is the church's responsibility to take care of the man of God and his family. I'm not talking about a man that's, that's, that's greedy for filthy lucre. I'm talking about it is the church's responsibility to take care of the man that delivers the word of God. It is the church responsibility. So here Paul says, even though we had the right to request and to require that you take care of us, we ate bread that we paid for. He said, we didn't even ask anything for free. He says, look at what he says in verse number eight, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. Y'all remember those days when they used to take the preacher? It's called take the preacher. It's called invite the preacher over after church service, after the pastoral service. So it, it was the pastoral Sunday, meaning that that's the Sunday we went to church and the pastor came to town. Because in the country, sometimes the pastor was a first Sunday pastor. And then another church, he was a first, second Sunday pastor. And another church, he was a third and fourth Sunday pastor. So on pastoral Sunday, some of the sisters and the brothers would invite the preacher to their house. And he showed up like clockwork. And they fed him. They took care of him. We don't do that anymore. And it's okay. But we ought to take care of him, what he needs. We ought to give to him, and he should not have to ask for it. We should not, he should not have to ask for you to take care of him. But here Paul says, he says, and I'm going to show it to you. He says, we didn't ask for anybody's bread for free. We did not get it free of charge. And then he says, but we worked, we labored, we toiled night and day. The apostle Paul was a tent maker. And by him making a tent, he, he kind of subsidized, subsidized his, his, um, his income. So he, he said, we labored night and day. He, in other words, we were willing to, to labor all day and all night. In other words, we were able to work the night shift, and we were willing to work the night shift. The Apostle Paul said, we worked the night shift. And when we worked the night shift, we worked the night shift so that we can pay for our own stuff. And let me just, just give you a tidbit here. A lot of people quote this scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
And they think it applies to every single thing in their lives. Let me just share with you. I used to play right field. I used to be able to run a ball down. At the crack of the bat, I could see it. I'd take one step back, and then I'd just take off like a jet. If we are interpreting scripture properly, I ought to be able to run it down today. But let me tell you, there are some young guys on the scene, and they can run the whole base zone. They can make it from first to home and from home back to home before I run the ball down now. If the, if the interpretation, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, if that was true, the way some of us interpret it, then I would be able to catch that same ball, run that same ball down right today, and I just can't do it. Does that mean that I'm, I'm not walking with the Lord? No. <laughs> I'm living in a tent. Paul made the tent, right? Paul was a tent maker, and he, he characterized this body we in as a tent. And because I'm living in a tent, my tent is leaking. He used to sing a song back home that said, if this old building keep on leaking, I'm going to move to another home. There's stuff that hurts. There's stuff that limits. So what Paul is saying in the book of Philippians where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. The conversation is built around the churches giving him financial donation for his preaching. And every man ought to receive compensation for his preaching and his teaching. So Paul says, some churches gave to me, other churches didn't give to me, and just because y'all don't wanna give to me, don't brag about how I'm gonna fail because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what that scripture is talking about. It's talking about the fact that he can toil all day and all night. He worked all day and all night. He paid for his own food. Pay, here it says bread, but it's talking about his own food. And he says the reason why we pay for our own food is because we didn't want to be a burden to anybody. We didn't want to be a burden to you. Now, I will say the church's responsibility is to take care of the preacher, but the preacher has to be wise enough to not be a burden to the church. So when you have a church with a small income, the pastor understands that income, and he ought not be a burden to the church. Yes. On the other hand, you have a church with a massive income, that church ought to take care of the man of God. The small church ought to take care of the man of God on their level. And the man of God has to realize that the small church has to continue to move and he ought not be a burden to them. Woo, good God Almighty. He ought not be a burden. Paul says that we don't want to be a burden. Then look at verse 9. He says, not because we did not have authority. This is what I want to show you. He says, I didn't, we chose to pay for our own bread, but we didn't do it because we didn't have the authority to do it. In other words, the word of God gives us the authority to accept bread freely, to accept food freely. But we didn't want to be an, a burden to you all, so we pay for it ourselves. And he says, not because we didn't have the authority. Yeah, we had the authority to require it. If you chose not to give it, that's between you and God. We have the authority to require it, to mandate it. We have the authority from Jesus Christ to require it. We have the authority to, to make sure we got it. But we chose not to. Look at why he says he chose not to. But to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. In other words, preachers have to put forth the first example in order for people to follow that preacher. Pastors ought to put forth the first example to make sure that the people are following his example. There are some pastors that show up at, on Sunday morning when it's time for him to preach. Not a good example. There are some pastors that won't pick up paper off the floor. Not a good example. If, if you want them to do something as a leader, you have to be willing to do it yourself. I will admit, the pastors should not be the key maintenance worker. He should not be the key janitor. 
But if push come to shove, if he had to get out there and work with his hands and his elbows, he ought not mind. Apostle Paul says we work day and night. <laughs> it didn't matter. In other words, we work graveyards, we work day shifts. <laughs> And we did it for an example to you. In other words, we set an example before you, and you need to just follow that example. We set an example before you. Every man of God, every leader, every teacher, every person that's born of the Spirit, every Christian ought to set an example for other people to follow. And the only way you set that example is that you do it first. You set an example first. You make sure you set the example. And when you set the example as a leader, then you can require others to follow. If you don't set an example as a leader, you can't require anybody else to follow. God, 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 keep me the type of leader that will set an example for others to follow. Because a leader that's leading and no one following, he's just taking a walk. I don't ever just want to take a walk as a leader. Yes, sir. Now we have verse number 10. And I wanted to save this verse till tonight rather than go into it last week because it's a common verse, but we need to unpack it well. Verse number 10, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 10. For even when we were with you, the apostle Paul says, we've been there with you now. And when we were with you, we commanded you this. Paul says, he's setting them up. He says, we were with you before. And when we were with you, we gave you a command. Here it is again. It's not a suggestion. It's, it's, not, it's not him asking. He is commanding. This word command means that, that I'm giving you a charge. And no military soldier should disrespect the commanding officer's charge. No police officer should, should disrespect the charge that comes from the captain, the charge that comes from the sergeant, the charge that comes from the lieutenant. Paul says, I charge you. He says, says to us, when we were with you, we told you this. When we're with you, we commanded you this. And here it is. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. My, my, my. That's verse number 11. Second that's verse number 10. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For while we were with you, we gave you a charge. We gave you a rule to go by. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. This is Paul putting together the church discipline and, re and telling them to make sure that men don't be called idle. Big Mama said it like this, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. You should not be called idle. He says, if a man will not work. Okay, sisters, back up. Let me just make it clear to you. It didn't say if the brother got laid off. It didn't even say if the brother got fired. But it does say, if he will not work, if he just refused to work, he ought not eat. But let, me, let me help you understand what I feel about it in the way I interpret it. If a man doesn't work, he ought to starve to death. A healthy man, a man that does not have mental problem, a man that does not have a disability, a man that is healthy, if he chooses not to work, if it's his choice to go to work and he chooses not to work, the Bible says he ought not eat. And if he doesn't eat, guess what he does? He willows up and he dies. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, if a man refuses to work, if a man refuses to get up and go to work, he should not eat. The problem here today is that we have too many working women and not enough working men. I mean, we got working women in the house, in the same house, and not enough 
working men. Now, let me back up again. Let me just say to you, I'm not talking about retired brothers. They paid their dues. I'm not talking about brothers that got an income coming in. They, they made a way to make that happen. They worked all their lives so they could get to this point, where, whether they want to sleep, whether they want to travel, whether they want to spend time with their loved ones. The bottom line is, if there's a dude, if there's a joker that just refuses to get a job, he ought not eat. In other words, they shouldn't feed him. His family members shouldn't feed him. And the church shouldn't feed him. That's what Paul said. The church ought not feed him. He says, if it doesn't work, don't eat. It's simple. Did you work today? No, we can't eat today. Why didn't you work? Couldn't find a job. Well, let me just tell you. Amazon got about 15,000 available right now. U.S. Postal Service got thousands upon thousands of jobs available right now. And there are jobs where you don't even have to have an education and they pay you $20 an hour. The Bible says if a man refuses to work, you ought not eat. We got these young guys out here robbing people. They need to get a job. Get a job, make a decent living, and don't jeopardize your life and your livelihood trying to rob somebody else because you're going to run up on somebody one day that's ready for a robber. The Bible says right here in the text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says, if a man doesn't work, he ought not eat. In other words, if a man doesn't work, he ought to die. If a man doesn't work, he ought to wither up and drop dead. Because if you don't eat, you die. Verse number 11. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all but are busy bodies. Paul says, Paul says, we, we got word. Paul says, we hear that there are some among you that won't work at all. There are some among you that, that refusing to work. And he labeled them as disorderly, ungodly, unrighteous men. And they're ungodly in this manner. But they are busy by. They are busy bodies. In other words, these men, they're passing their lives in idleness. They're neglectful of their duties. And I just like to say to men, you're not a man. Jesse Jackson had it right. Reverend Jesse Jackson had it right. You're not a man when you can make a baby. You're a man when you can provide for a baby and protect the baby. That's when you are a man. It says in the book, in the text, in the Bible, he says, don't deal with men who are passing their lives up in idleness. Men who are spending their time, spinning their wheel. Those who neglect their duties. Because they're being busybodies. This word busybody. This word busybody means that they are all off in other folk affairs instead of doing work on their own. You, you've seen it. You've seen it, don't you? you have, haven't you seen it? There's one boy. When I was growing up, there was we were working at Burger King. They when Burger King had the big old brown and yellow and blue and black stripes. Big old, you can see a Burger King employee from a mile off. I was walking the streets of Jackson, Mississippi, up and down the hills to get to Burger King. And as I passed by my friends on the way to Burger King, they would be sitting on the side of the curb. Man, don't go to work today. You don't have to go today, do you? Don't go to work today. You can hang out with us one day, can't you? It's men who are following idleness, men who are caught up in neglecting their duties, just sitting under the tree, sitting on the curb, doing nothing. Paul says, remove yourself from them. If they don't work, don't feed them. If they don't work, don't eat. If you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't work, you die. The Apostle Paul says, there are men among you. We've heard it. There are men among you who are just Busy body. And these guys that sit on the curb as I was walking by with my ugly Burger King uniform on, they were always in my business. 
I don't know about them, but I was going to school after the summer was over. And I had to buy school clothes. So I worked Burger King, got off at 2 o'clock in the morning, was glad about it. Didn't have a problem with it. <laughs> but if it don't work, all night eat. If you're able to work, you ought to go to work. You ought to spend time. Because you will find yourself as busybodies caught up in other people's affairs. Verse number 12, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Those who refuse to work, we telling you to shut your mouth. <laughs> work in quietness. Work in a peaceful way and eat your own food. Make sure you take care of your own necessities. God deliver me from grown women, grown men, healthy young people that sit up on their parents and won't get their own job. Pastor Paul says, withdraw from them. Let them go. Stop arguing with them. They ought to be grown, gone, on their own, with their own home, paying their own bills. Hallelujah. He says, withdraw yourself from them. I mean, these people who are a sound mind, who are a healthy body, and they just refuse to work. And they always in everybody else's affairs. Verse 12 says, he charged you and exact, exhort you. He says, as ministers, we are telling you and we are, we are admonishing you. Those of you who won't work, we're telling you, whatever you do, go and work. Buy your own food. Buy your own necessities, buy whatever you want, and work quietly. Be quiet. Stop meddling in other people's business. Says whatever you do, get your job. I mean, jobs are there are jobs that are plentiful now. You know, people say that, well, they ain't paying what I want to pay. Well, what you making now? It's not what I want to do. Well, what you doing now? Well, I got a dream. I said to a young man the other day, he, he said, I, I got a dream. Well, what's your dream? I want to be my own. I'm going to be my own entrepreneur. I'm going to be the boss. I said, yeah, but you got to make some money in order to get something so you can have something to boss. If you don't make money on somebody's job, you will never be a boss because you're going to be sitting here 10 years from now with a dream. What you do is you work hard on your present job or the job you're going to get after tonight. <laughs> you work hard on your job. You save your money. You put it aside so you can pursue your dream. You don't just pursue a dream because all you have is a dream. You need money to make your dream come true. <laughs> and you need to pay your own way as you go. Even though you're pursuing your dream, you ought to be able to pay your way to pursue your dream. Paul says, be quiet. Paul says, get out of other people's business. Mm -hmm. Paul says, get you some business. The songwriter says, spend six months to mind your own business and six months to leave somebody else's business alone. Yes, Finally, verse number 13, and I quit for tonight. But as for you, brethren, do not grow, grow weary and doing good. Apostle Paul says, as for you, brothers, do not lose heart. This word, grow weary, this phrase, grow weary. Do not become weary. Do not lose heart in doing what is right. Keep doing what is right. But continue to do well. Continue in your well-doing without weakening. He says, don't grow weary. Don't get weak. Apostle Paul says, you, you work and you feed yourself and you work and you chase your dream. And when you work and chase your dream, you, got, you don't have time to get in other people's business. He says, whatever you do, take six months. That's how I interpret that. Take six months to mind your own business and six months to leave everybody else's business alone. Do not be busybodies. Man doesn't work, man shouldn't eat. Man doesn't apply himself, 
withdraw from him. A man doesn't follow the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, withdraw from him. If a man doesn't follow the principles that we have given you and we've taught you over the years, remove yourself from his presence. One bad apple spoils a whole bunch. Yeah. So I leave you tonight to remind you that even the church has to have some discipline. Even the church has to have guidelines. Apostle Paul says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 10, I command you to work. If you don't work, if you refuse to work, you shouldn't eat. Apostle Paul says, he's heard of many of you have walked this way. Many of you are living your lives like this. He said he's heard about it. And then he says, whatever you do, command them and exhort them to get a job. I want to make sure it's clear before we leave the air tonight. When it says if a man doesn't work, he ought not eat. It's not talking about the brother who's disabled and can't do it. It's not talking about the brother or the sister who got laid off and can't find a job yet, but they're on their way. It's not talking about the person who even got fired and, and they are rapidly looking for a job. This text is talking about the brother or the sister who would just refuse to flat out get a job and work. Paul says, we have become a godly example to you. We work night and day. We expect you to work night and day. Young people with dreams, go ahead and dream. You ought to dream, but you need to work your dreams. And sometimes in order for your dream to be worked, you got to work for somebody else first. You don't just come out of high school. I'm going to be my own entrepreneur. God, God has gifted you, but make some money. And as you make some money, do your little side gig on the side. There may be somebody gathered with us tonight who's never received Jesus Christ. I've talked much about the gospel and what God has presented to us through Jesus Christ. I recommend Jesus. If you're struggling with this text, if you're struggling with the word of God, you need to try Jesus. Try him. And if you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. This is the invitation. The door is open. The invitation is extended to you. If you want to know Jesus, if you want him in your life, if you want to invite him in, this is the moment you can come right in. The door is open. If you want to die and go to heaven, you need Jesus Christ. You need to believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for your sin. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave his life for you. Jesus died on Calvary. Jesus died on the cross. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. You can get to know him tonight. If you would, just repeat after me. Just bow your head and invite him in. And you can be saved right here, right now. Even on a Wednesday night, you can get to know Jesus. Just bow your head and repeat after me and say these words. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. Now come into my life and make me a new person. I believe that you died and rose from the dead. Lord, I thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you're now born again, you're saved, you, you're on your way to heaven. We believe that, that you have been born again. There may be others who are struggling with the life that you live, those who or say, but for some reason or the other, you just can't get it right. You struggle with life as it come and life as it is. I recommend not only that you realize that you're saved, but also recommend that you recon reconnect with God, that you repent, that, that you be restored. 
I want to pray with you tonight. Lord Jesus, we pray for those who struggle with sin. And Lord, I know that's all of us. I pray for them to be reconnected. I pray for repentance. I pray, Father God, that you deliver them from being captivated by sin. Pray that you bless us all now, that we will focus on you and Jesus alone. Make us sensitive to the movement of your Holy Spirit and the speaking of your Holy Spirit, that we will obey him and not our personal agendas. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. There may be others who have gone off and left your church home or you're in between church homes or you don't have a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. I recommend the New Beginning Church that, that you can come and fellowship with us. You can fellowship globally or you can fellowship locally here in the Southeast Houston area. If you want to be a member of New Beginning Church, inbox me and let me know you want to be a member. Be glad to have you. And if you've received Christ tonight or rededicated your life tonight, inbox me and let me know. Sure would like to rejoice with you and praise God for you. Again, thank you tonight for joining us in our Bible study. Thank you for being a part. Please meet us here every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. At 7.15 p.m., meet us every Wednesday night. And on Sunday morning, you can meet us at 9 a.m. for Sunday school and 10.30 a.m. for worship service. We'll be glad to have you as a part. We're back in the building. We'll be glad to have you as a part of our worship service. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service and blessing us with your presence here on today. <coughs> we want to continue to pray for those who are in bereavement. We want to continue to pray for those who are sick. We want to continue to wrap, ask the Lord to wrap his arms around them. I want to lift up Shelly Alvarado and her family during this time of sickness, we want to lift them. We want to also lift up the Galvan's family, Galvan's family and the Rodriguez family in this time of bereavement. We want to lift up Sister Joseph and, and, and her family in time of bereavement as well as the Stubblefield family. We'll lift them before the Lord. We, we want to continue to pray that the Lord bless them and keep them. And for you and me, we want to lift you before the Lord and thank God for your presence. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity to come before you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless those who are bereaved, bless those who are sick, bless those who are down and out, bless those, Father God, who need encouragement. I ask you to do it as only you can. Bless as only you can. Keep them as only you can. Continue to walk with them and bless them to realize that you're the king, you're the God, you're the final judge, and you're the one that keeps it, us under control. We thank you now. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. If you want to give to New Beginning Church, you can do so by two means. Number one, you can, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com the idea is as we lift up jesus he draws all men unto himself and then you can mail your offering your your gift you can mail your tithes into p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 Thank you so much. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you.